Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack a Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Sweepstakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Here's worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Hey there. Welcome to episode 9 of ATL and 29, the podcast that looks at the NBA from the starting point of Atlanta. My name is Kevin Chenard. The Hawks have a game Friday at home against the Detroit Pistons, and today we'll talk to Duncan Smith of Piston Powered, the Pistons affiliate for the fan-sided network. On today's episode, we'll discuss the Pistons, why they have so many strange hairstyles, and why they also have all of the Milwaukee Bucks rookies from 2011. We'll also discuss the potential of Friday's game turning into a -a hack-a-shackathon. Duncan and I also spend a few minutes discussing the Pistons' point guard situation, how the team differs with Ish Smith versus Reggie Jackson, and whether or not Jackson may be back in time for Friday's game. And finally, before we do the Pistons at all, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking solo about the Hawks and their loss to the Warriors Monday, because I thought we saw some things from the Hawks in that game that we hadn't really seen before. Today's episode was made possible by Poli Mortgage Group. Poli Mortgage Group. Rates, integrity, service. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's get started. Before we get into talking to Duncan about the Pistons and Detroit's game on Friday against the Hawks, I just wanted to talk straight up about the Hawks for a few minutes because I thought they played a very intriguing game Monday in the loss to the Warriors. I thought what stood out in that game in particular was the strong play of the starters. Uh, Up until the last couple of games against the Lakers and the Warriors, you know, the starters had been, you know, somewhere around negative 11 or negative 12 points per 100 possessions, which obviously, you know, isn't a great uh, thing for the Hawks. But in the last couple of games, the starters have started to gel a little bit. A few weeks ago, um, you know, we were asking Coach Bud about his combinations of big men, especially with respect to Mike Muscala. And he said, you know, that when he paired Muscala with Millsap and when he paired Muscala with Howard, he saw a lot of good things. And, you know, Muscala's having a nice shooting year and and able to stretch the floor. Uh, But when we've seen Howard paired with Millsap so far this season, uh, you know, it hasn't always been great, in part because I think when you put Schroeder, Bazemore, Millsap, and Howard on the floor together, you know, you get into some spacing issues. And... It's not that the Hawks can't survive with that unit, but they're going to have to be very crisp. In particular, you know, they can't be uh, having too many turnovers and things like that. But going back to Budenholzer, what he said about the millsap Howard combination is that he thought that they could be a real grind-out combination defensively. You know, he thought that there was some real explosiveness that he could see on defense between those two. Uh, or when those two were the the two big men being used together. And I think, you know, through most of the season, we hadn't really seen that, even though the Hawks have had the best defense in the NBA by points per possession for a lot of the season. um, I think it was really in the last couple of games where you, you know, you watch Millsap and Howard together, and they're really getting things done defensively, in particular against the Warriors. Here's what Tabo Cephalosha said after the game Monday. We want to think ourselves as a, as a team that can be at that level, compete against a team like this, and be in those type of games. So, you know, you, you get a blowout game, you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, we didn't bring it. A game like this, you know, I think we can learn a lot because uh, hopefully we're going to be into a lot of situations like this. Do you just find this was a game tonight though, where a few, few more made shots could have been a difference? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think uh, since the beginning of the season, pretty much, you know, the shots has, has not been falling really much for us. Um, you know, we just got to 
keep getting guys open, keep, set, keep setting good screens and, uh, and moving the ball. Are the positive you can take out of this game the fact that you guys pretty much you guys pretty much held the Warriors in check? I mean, normally their offense goes off for higher than 100. Yeah, I think defensively we were good. I mean, we've been good the whole season, so that's one thing that we can uh, definitely, uh, you know, night in and night out, kind of kind of rely on. Um, now it's the offensive end, you know, that we uh, that we need to uh, to find a few more things and, and down the stretch, you know, it showed. I think one of the things that we have seen from the Millsap-Howard combination, especially with respect to Howard in that Warriors game, was some versatility defensively. Um, you know, Millsap and, and Horford last season were unbelievably flexible. You know, being able to trap and do things outside and being able to protect the rim inside. And, you know, while Howard has been a better defender inside, we hadn't seen as much of him on the perimeter. And I thought we saw a nice balance of Dwight Howard doing good things in the Warriors game. When the Warriors were playing two bigs, when they were playing Draymond Green with another big like Zaza, the Warriors were running pick and rolls with Draymond Green and Steph Curry. And what the Hawks were doing, which was really smart and very well executed, is they were sending both players to Curry with the point guard fighting over the top of the screen, chasing from behind. Draymond, whoever was guarding him, was, you know, staying in front of Curry. Howard was, you know, guarding his big man and staying underneath the rim, and they were basically daring Draymond Green to shoot. And that worked very well because, you know, Draymond didn't hit a lot of jumpers in that game. Then later, and that this is what was really impressive, when the Warriors went to their version of the death line death lineup and really Draymond was the only big the Hawks were able to keep Howard and Millsap in the game. And Howard, in particular, did a lot of nice things defending out on the perimeter. There was one play in transition where Kevin Durant was setting up for a fast break three-pointer. And, you know, even though Durant had a couple of steps on him, Howard kept chasing the play from behind and eventually got there to contest the attempt and force Durant into a miss. And then on another play, you know, he, Howard got left in space out beyond the three-point line guarding Steph Curry, and he stayed with him. Curry eventually, you know, just kind of pulled up for a jump shot, and Howard was there to contest it, and it was a miss too. I think it was an air ball. And so, you know, seeing Howard defend in space, I thought, was a really positive thing and a good sign for the Hawks starters going forward. You know, a couple of other notes from this game. It was the Hawks' fifth game in seven nights, which is, you know, as brutal a stretch as you're going to see in the NBA, especially since for the Hawks, most of it came on a West Coast trip, sandwiched around a major holiday. Um, You really can't put together a worse stretch. And, and, you know, furthermore, I think it comes in a stretch when the Hawks play 13 games in 19 nights, which is, again, you know, over a longer period of time, really as bad a stretch of, of scheduling as as you can have uh, in this version of the schedule. So, you know, for the Hawks, I I think they're going to turn it around. And really, you know, you look at the Warriors, and that's probably the greatest offensive team in NBA history once all is said and done. And the Hawks, you know, other than a, a few slips early in the first quarter, really defended them as well as, as any team could. We turned the ball over too much in the first half. And... They are, they do a good. We knew going into the game they do a good job of forcing their opponents into turnovers, um, but we just had some careless ones where you know, losing dribbles out of bounds, uh, trying to thread a needle a little bit and just rushing, um, and so it, it just uh, wasn't wasn't clicking early. Um, I'd look at the film to figure out more what they were doing on you know, collapsing the paint and, sh- and getting deflections or if it was just us. Um, just being a little bit careless. If you combine what Steph Curry was saying with what Kevin Durant said after the game, which was something to the effect of, you know, the Hawks were strong on the inside, you know, that combination of interior defense and exterior defense might be something that that makes the Hawks one of the better defensive teams, if not the best defensive team uh, in the NBA this season. And so that's a really intriguing combination. Here's Kevin Durant. You know, this is a physical team. They came in and pushed us all night. Uh, you know, 
They were on a, they were on a high. They lost bad against the Lakers the night before, so they wanted to come out and have a great performance. In the first half, um, they kind of hit us in the mouth. And I think the second half, we started to pick it up a bit. So, you know, it seems like the Hawks have to figure out a few things on offense. Uh, it's good that Dennis Schroeder looks like, you know, he's ready to turn things around. He was really great uh, against the Warriors at, at using screens to get to the rim and score or find his teammates, depending on what was available. For the Hawks, it's just going to come down to probably that they need a little bit more shooting, either from the players that have already been been in the rotation or possibly, you know, maybe they'll get some more from Mike Scott, who is listed as questionable for Wednesday's game, tonight's game in Phoenix. But the defense is there. That's really the key thing for the Hawks. You know, they look like they can be a team that, you know, can defend in the old style using trapping and pressure and things like that, but also one that can stand up to physical teams on the inside. I want to take a minute to talk about today's sponsor, Poli Mortgage Group. Poli Mortgage Group encourages people to shop rates when they're looking to refinance or buy a new home. They have some of the lowest rates in the country and some of the lowest closing costs too. They'll even give you a quote where they'll credit your money towards the closing costs or cover all of them. Check them out at their website www.polimortgage.com that's www.polimortgage.com or call them at 781-232-8000 make sure to tell them that ATL and 29 sent you to receive a credit of $50 towards your closing costs offers cannot be combined with other offers Poli Mortgages Rates Integrity Service all licensing information is in the show notes Poli is an equal housing lender. We are here with Duncan Smith. You can follow Duncan on Twitter at Duncan Smith NBA. He's an editor for Piston Powered and a writer for Hoops Habit. The Hawks have a game Friday. They're bringing the Pistons into Phillips Arena. Welcome, Duncan. How are you doing today? Good. Uh, I wanted to start you off with the three quick questions. Are you ready for it? Let's do it. All right. The first one. What is your version of Waiter's Island? Uh, I think my version of Waiter's Island would be uh, Cantavius Caldwell Pope Pencil- Peninsula. Uh, um, he's, uh, he's a bit of a divisive topic among uh, Pistons fans and Piston Twitter. Um, I'm a proponent of paying him pretty much whatever it takes to keep him in Detroit. He's, uh, he's a restricted free agent this coming offseason. Um, sounds like he's looking to get twenty million dollars per season. Uh, it, that sounds like a lot of money in a vacuum, uh, but when we look at the exploding cap situation and the fact that he's actually better than most fans give him credit for, um, I think that there's a pretty solid case in his favor. Uh, I don't know if I stand alone, but I think that I'm probably the uh, the loudest voice on that peninsula right now. <laughs> you'll you'll probably have. Uh most of Georgia on your side come Friday night. He's one of those players like Lou Williams, uh, a Georgian native who just comes home and ravages uh, Phillips Arena. Yes, he does. Yeah, that's one thing <laughs> we're looking forward to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I could see him having a big game Friday. I, I don't know what it is about about Georgia homecomings. They just seem to be better than, than homecomings anywhere else, I guess. Apparently so, yeah. The home cooking or something, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so my second question was, uh, if you could swap vehicles with any NBA player, who would you swap vehicles with? This was a tough one at first when I was thinking about this one, but then I remembered that Kobe Bryant has a helicopter, and I want a helicopter. I want that helicopter in particular, to be honest. (laughs) (laughs) And what are you going to be giving Kobe in return? Uh, I have a horrible old 2004 Ford Focus that is all his. What's he going to do with it? Will he fit? I mean, he's, uh, what is he, 6'6"? Six, six? I believe six, so. Seven? Yeah, that's only about four inches taller than me. He'll fit. He'll fit. Okay, good. He'll fit. He'll probably miss his helicopter, though. Yeah, he'll be able to maneuver like tight corners and like streets and stuff better, but... Um, I think there's a trade-off. <laughs> you know what the weird thing about that question is? Kobe's not an NBA player. Yeah, Isn't actually, that weird I've... to say that? That just, just, just sounds funny. 
It really is. As you were asking the question again, I was like, you know what? This is not a valid answer because Kobe Bryant is no longer an NBA player. Uh, I didn't. It didn't even click in my head until just now, and it that, didn't click when I was prepping for this question or anything. I, I, that's Kobe okay. Bryant. Helicopters are fun. Yeah, but Kobe Bryant isn't an NBA player, and that's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 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 a shame. All right, third question. What were you thinking when you tweeted? And this goes back to November 22. You tweeted, hey, at Baron Davis, what's your favorite memory of the palace at Auburn Hills? Oh, man. Um, I had put out on both my Twitter account and the Piston Power Twitter account earlier uh, earlier that day because that was when the Pistons announced that they were going to be moving out of the palace, back downtown. Um, I wanted to get a, a vibe for what fans' favorite mem- memories were um, of the palace. And while I was asking that question on Twitter, I remembered that Baron Davis follows me on Twitter. Um, and, you know, this, this is a guy who's been around for a long time, so he's been to the palace quite a bit. So I thought maybe, uh, maybe I would shoot my shot and see what Baron Davis has to say about the palace. Um, so I asked him what his favorite memory was, and he pretty quickly responded that uh, a game-winning dunk at the palace was his favorite memory, which I think completely qualifies. Um, I, dig- I dug the, the video of that dunk up. Um, he slammed one home over, uh, over Bobby Sura with, like, six seconds left, I think, in the fourth quarter <laughs> at the Palace. Um, so I, I tweeted that back at him. I said, y'all, this is Baron Davis' favorite memory of the Palace. Uh, needless to say, this qualifies. Poor Bobby Sura. And pretty quickly he responded with uh, three smiley faces. So uh, maybe I made his day, and he definitely made mine. <laughs> Bobby Sura was a piston. Yeah, it happened. I don't... How many years? Is my memory that bad, or was it like one year? To be honest... Um, finding that video jogged my memory. I had kind of forgotten that he had been a piston. It was uh, okay, good. Yeah, I don't you're not have alone. To feel so bad then. No, I have I have less excuse because I'm a lifelong piston fan and everything. But it was like the teal era, and um, piston fans kind of try to pretend the teal era never really happened. <laughs> well, don't say that to Hawks owner Grant Hill. <sighs> the only good thing of it, <laughs> Hawks minority owner. Hawks minority owner, yes. Really, yeah. That, although, you know, one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite little things about, uh, you know, following the team is going to watch the, going to watch the teams as they sort of do their pregame shoot arounds and things like that, and you know, hmm. you know, slip in at five thirty, six o'clock for a seven o'clock game, and the players are out there. Well, one game, I went out there, and it was Toronto was out there, and it was you know the the crew of of young Raptors, you know, Bruno Caboclo and, you know, Bebe and some of the other young guys that, that mm-hmm. you know, sort of shift up and down between Toronto and uh, Toronto 905 in the D-League. And I have to say that uh, I, I'm watching this game and I'm thinking, you know, who who is that coach out there that's running three on three with them? Because it was pretty obvious that none of these players were, uh, none of these players were going to participate in the game because they were going at it hard. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, they they're really uh, they're really going at it hard. But one of them was one of the coaches, and I'm thinking, wow, he looks really really good. And you know, get a little closer, get a little closer, and it's it's Jerry Stackhouse. He was running three on three with those young pups, and he was he was looking really good. Man, just just a touch too old to play, eh? but he could probably just hold his own against those guys. <laughs> Seriously, yeah, you could just yeah. you know he's the head coach of the 905, but you know if he ever wanted to just kind of jump in a game, he'd be probably fit in just just fine. Yeah, throw him a 10-day contract, dress him up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm also going to have you participate in our 100 to 200 segment. The idea here being that we ask you for some sort of controversial opinion. It can be very lukewarm controversial in the 100 range uh, or up higher in the 200 degree range. Um, and after you say what your particular opinion is and, and why you think that, I'll take a guess at how you would have scored it. Sound good? Sounds good. All right. Take it away. All right. My take is that Kevin Durant is the real MVP this season. Um, it 
is maybe a little bit counterintuitive to um, the generally accepted knowledge, considering the fact that he has gone to like a historic team to begin with. Um, but the kind of impact that he's had on the floor, basically taking an extremely good offense and helping make it perhaps the best offense that's ever been put on the floor, uh, I think is it's what could really with some finality put them over the top and make them not only like this year's champion but like truly the best team that's ever played uh, I think that from instead of just looking at it with um, the perspective like focused simply on this year um, I think Kevin Durant makes a great Golden State team um, I think it ha- it gives them the opportunity to be, to be a truly historic champion and nobody since Michael Jordan has had the chance to do that with anybody in my opinion that sounds good all right so it's it's weird you know you you said Kevin Durant is the real MVP which I sort of believe I don't I you know I don't know that that's I don't know it just that doesn't feel scorching hot now if you said something like Kevin Durant is going to win the MVP award that would feel more controversial just because you know he probably split some votes with his teammates and Right. I think Kawhi is going to put together a, a, a good campaign at it. If if Russell Westbrook averages a triple double, that's going to scamper up some votes. Giannis looks really good. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. I'll be a Bucks homer for a minute. <laughs> James Harden. I mean, Harden. James is Harden. Undeniable so, as a candidate. Yeah, but I mean, I I do think. I do think you know I that just in terms of one player impacting winning outcomes of basketball games, I think Kevin Durant really is the MVP. He's he's going to make them win so many games, in a lot of cases, very easily. So I would probably put that at like a 125, just because he's really great, and what he does for that team is just absolutely absurd. Yeah, yeah it really is. You're not too far off. I had 160. Oh, 116 or 160? 160, 160. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Now, I promise we'll get into some more serious questions soon, but uh, we're still feeling things out here. Whose hair is worse, Aaron Baines or Benno Udry? Oh, Aaron Baines. Aaron Baines by a long shot, I think. Um, really? I-, I think so, yeah. I think... Uh, I think... Bano has maybe a bit of a sort of a, a Euro flair that maybe in some circles might be kind of acceptable. Whereas what Aaron Baines is rocking is just not acceptable in any circle, I don't think. Yeah, I think I think it's hard for me to separate it just because you see them in basketball uniforms and it just they both look kind of silly. But I yeah. could see I could see Benno's looking a little bit better, you know, once you put it put on a, a shirt and tie wear some fancy threads it probably looks a little better than Aaron's at that point and poor Aaron is wearing the mask too right ah uh, the mask I watched the game tonight and I'm trying to remember the the mask came off I believe oh did it uh, okay I think so yeah but yeah the mask really uh, it added a surreal flair to whatever the hell is going on up there <laughs> 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 which piston fan or no I don't approve of <laughs> fair enough all right, so by some weird circumstance, uh, somehow the Pistons ended up with the entire crop of rookies from the 2011-2012 Milwaukee Bucks, which is to say they have Tobias Harris and John Luer. Speaking, now I'm saying that right, Luer, right? Yes. Ha- have people in Detroit figured out how to say Benno Udry? Or is That's... he still getting a lot of the <laughs> I-, I think w- what I've been hearing is Udry. Okay, good. Uh... Yeah, they're they're not trying to overly accent that that H, which doesn't seem to need to be there. <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, All right, yeah. sorry, sidebar. Um, but those two players intrigue me, especially since back in 2011, I was writing about the Bucks at that point. And uh, so maybe tackling Tobias Harris first. How has he fared in the absence of Reggie Jackson? And did that in any way sort of bring out his his ball making, playmaking skills at all. Yes, I think that he's he's done a, a really good job of finding his own shot better. Um, he's 
he's able to move with the ball, which is something that Pistons, not named Reggie Jackson in general, just aren't very good at. Um, being able to create your own offense on this team with, with Ish Smith being your point guard is, is really important. And I think he's a big part of why the Pistons have managed to basically maintain just a little bit worse than a 500 pace while not playing very well without their starting point guard. Um, so yeah, I think that I think that Tobias has been vital for the Pistons. Uh, he's their most efficient scorer by uh, by a, a really long shot right now, and again, that's without um, starting NBA point guard assistance. When when Ish Smith isn't in the game, does does he ever initiate the offense, or are they pretty much just run it through the backup point guard? It's primarily a run through through uh, through Beno. K- KCP can't tell you, you know. I'll try and get this name out properly here. Kentavious Caldwell Pope has actually <laughs> been uh, the last few games. He's been a much more frequent distributor as well. Uh, he had ten assists against the Clippers, I think. Um, tonight, I'm trying to bring up his numbers here. I think I literally just closed the stats on uh, on the game um, from earlier tonight, but he had five or six assists, I believe, as well tonight. And this is a guy who who averages right around two, two and a half assists per game over the course of his career. So um, I think that they've been uh, they've been able to sort of stretch KCP and Tobias Harris's comfort zones a little bit in in Reggie's absence. And I think that that might actually pay off dividends down the road if KCP is a more capable uh, distributor on offense. Okay. And what about John Luer? Is he sort of taken into the role of, of being sort of a prototypical Stan Van Gundy uh, power forward? Um, he he was supposedly brought in primarily because like he's a he big he's a big who can shoot really well. Um, and strangely enough, the only thing he hasn't done well since coming over is shoot threes. Um, he's shooting twenty eight point six percent from three point range. Uh, but he's averaging like 15 and 10 point, 15 points and 10 rebounds per 36 minutes right now off the bench, and he's the first big off the bench, the first guy off the bench actually. Um, in most cases, he's averaging like 27 minutes per game right now, and I think that that is uh, an, an expanded role compared to what we were expecting of him when he came. Um, he's getting numbers, he's getting minutes that are just shy of starting um, yeah just start, just shy of the starters minutes basically and in my opinion he's been one of the biggest sources of stability for the Pistons um, whether it be off the bench on the bench whatever um, without Reggie Jackson everything is just kind of weird like Andre Drummond has the second worst net rating on the team for example um, it's, it's just strange when your best player is also like um a net rating sieve, basically. Um, John Luer, on the other hand, is has a net rating of 2.1, plus 2.1 points per 100 possessions, and he's getting some real volume minutes. So um, I think that he's been much more valuable, and um, he's been a guy that when he checks in, uh, it's really easy to have a sense of confidence about what you're going to see out of him. Uh, he's, he's just steady, you know? Good. So speaking of... Uh... 2011, 2012 rookies. Were were you uh, tracking the Pistons at the time that that Brandon Knight was drafted? I was a fan, a uh, fairly casual fan. I didn't start writing about the Pistons or anything until about a year ago. Um, but yeah, I I liked the pick. I liked having him on the team. I liked the fact that he got a lot of minutes right off the bat. Uh, he started 60 games. As I'm looking at his numbers here to jog my memory. Um, yeah, I I was a fan. What did you think of the trade at the time they made that first trade, where Brandon Knight went to the went to the Bucks with Chris Middleton, and Brandon Jennings went to the Pistons? Did Did you like that trade at the time? I was skeptical. Um, I at the time I didn't really know a whole lot about Brandon Jennings, other than uh, you know he had that fifty point game and everything. Um, but at the same time, I knew he had a poor reputation as far as being a uh, capable leader of your offense um, so I was skeptical I 
don't think any of us really saw what Chris Middleton was going to turn into. So if we could have seen that, that would have been nice. <laughs> I would have, right. I would have gladly vetoed that trade just on that that basis alone. Um, yeah, that's the crazy part about that trade is at the time it was Brandon Jennings, Brandon Knight. It was the Brandon trade, and then really wasn't the Brandon trade at all. It was the Chris Middleton trade. Yeah, it's funny when the throw-in becomes becomes the main focus down the road. I just like when we were talking about Grant Hill, you know, oh. uh, Ben Wallace. Ben Wallace ended up being the guy. And that was the Grant Hill trade. It, yeah. All right. So, what's the timeline for Reggie Jackson? Uh, there was was it earlier today or yesterday? Um, I think it was. Yeah, it was yesterday. He was cleared for full practice, and it looks like he might be in the lineup by the end of the road trip. Um, I think that puts him. I'm trying to find their schedule for the rest of the week. I've, I've, I've been kind of out of it for the last few days um my weekend was insane and i'm just kind of getting caught back up but yeah it sounds like by the weekend he might be he might be fully back and ready to roll okay so that's is there then then there's a slight chance he might play against the hawks then it sounds like it's possible um from from the most recent the most recent word that i've heard and uh hopefully that's the case because they they need him (laughs) they need him Right, and so how does that change the Pistons' offense when he comes back? I mean, I, Ish Smith is just a player that I've always sort of liked his game just because, you know, he he seems to be able to direct an offense, and he's so ridiculously fast with the ball, you know, in terms of just being able to take the ball with him on the move somewhere. And at the same time, you know, he's not really much of a shooter. And he had a great season, I thought, last year with Philadelphia. But in that bigger role where he's starting and playing a lot of minutes. Uh, is it sort of something that other teams can exploit once they, once you get a little bit used to him? Yeah, uh, I think that's definitely the case. Last season, I think that, that Ish had sort of the uh, the looter in a riot effect that you hear people talk about with, uh, with the Sixers sometimes, where like one guy of NBA caliber who's going to get the ball a lot and get a lot of minutes just puts up maybe uh, unsustainably big numbers on on a team of, you know, NBA caliber. Okay, um, but I thought he, so, like, I mean, it seemed like he got more than just his numbers. I thought he was good for, like, the kids there, just kind of getting them into their spots. I mean, I guess they really didn't have much at point. Well, yeah, that's the guard. thing. Like, he, he was good for the kids, getting them in their spots, but that's because... Um, you know they they don't have anything even remotely close to an NBA caliber point guard, and he's the closest thing they had. So right. um, he was he was better than anything else they were going to be able to throw out there. And you know so he he did have a beneficial effect. But when the bar is so low, you know that's that's kind of like the least that you can you can hope for, I think, with him. So so what uh, part of the uh, offense or which player benefits the most from Reggie Jackson coming back? Besides you know obviously Jackson, it's going to be Andre Drummond. Um, if you if you look at Ish Smith's uh, synergy stats, everything is like in the high teens, low twenties as far as percentile goes uh, when it comes to running the offense. Like his, I think he's in the seventeenth or twentieth percentile in running the pick and roll as a ball handler. Um, his spot up shooting is just well. I mean, the book is out on Ish as a shooter. He just he can't do it, and that's one thing that hurts the pick and roll as well. Like when you can just sag off on the on Andre Drummond and not have to even pretend that you're caring about the point guard taking a shot from outside. So just sit back on both. I mean, that's something that the Hawks have had to worry a little bit about, too. You know, yeah. their offense now is, you know, generated a lot by Schroeder Howard pick and rolls. And, you know, they're dealing with the same thing. People don't you know, if you if you pick the most desirable option out of that, the most desirable option is sitting back and saying, you know what, go ahead and get what you can get with a jump shot. Exactly. Yeah, it throws everything out of sync. You know, like I I think that the Pistons have they have really awful rebounding numbers, which is strange for a team with you know the best rebounder in the NBA, arguably. And I think that some of that is because like you can just like throw an extra guy in the paint every single time. Ish Smith has the ball. Sure. Um, you know, like they're just going to get all the rebounds, and um, I think that 
I think that it just kind of has this spiraling effect on everything just not quite functioning right because defenses can cheat so badly on Ish when he has the ball. And they can't do that with Reggie Jackson. Like, they, they sure. can't, you know, they can't sag because he will make them pay. He's not an elite shooter, but he's good enough, and the threat is there. So it's, it's going to change a lot um, for, the, for the pick and roll, and I think Andre Drummond by far is the most likely guy to, to benefit from this. And that's going to be good for the rest of the team because he has really seemed at times very unengaged, and that's costly. Is there a ch- what what what's drumming shooting from the free throw line this season? And is there a chance that Boonholzer you think might uh, might go into hack a shack, or do you think that because he has Howard on his own team, doesn't even want to sort of bring up that suggestion? <laughs> yeah, I think that a team that has a guy like uh, DeAndre Jordan or Dwight Howard might want to avoid like the mutually assured destruction that could come from it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Basketball, you know, like, and actually, the the Hawks normally start their games at seven thirty. This one starts at eight. So oh if God. we have a game that starts at eight, and they do hack a shack on both sides, you know, we we could be you know maybe throwing in overtime, and we could be leaving at like one in the morning or something. It's going to be a long night, man. <laughs> 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 yeah, it, Andre's free throw shooting is somewhat improved to forty six point three percent, but I think that that's a bit. Uh, a bit misleading. Um, if you can shoot 46.3%, you can shoot you know, 28% when you've got the track record that Andre has. Um, not that long ago, he was shooting, I think, uh, 62% over like a 10-game sample, and that had him like well over 50%, and now we're back under. So I think we're regressing to the mean, which is basically a high 30s, low 40s free throw shooter. Um, yeah, it's it's not good. <laughs> I'm hoping that the Pistons have a shoot around Friday because of all the coaches in the NBA, the one I look forward to, you know, asking questions of most is Stan Van Gundy. Just kind of a combination of of, you know, one he he's not he's not a jerk. Let's start there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> he, you know, he's helped. nice to the media, <laughs> but he's also uh-huh. insightful and occasionally funny and, and you know, in terms of giving you good material for what you want to write about, he's terrific. And so I was going to ask you, you know, maybe Stan Van Gundy included, who would you put in your top three head coaches from from uh, from three to one in terms of uh, who you think says the most interesting things in quotes? Um, I think that the the recent quote outbursts from coaches around the NBA after the uh, the recent American election. I'm Canadian, so I'm specifying that was your election not mine um <laughs> you know whether the, the, regardless of like your political leanings i think that it, it was very interesting that um that three coaches in particular had some pretty strong things to say and uh i would say that my top three uh would be stan van gundy greg popovich and steve kerr which those, those are the three guys that were the most outspoken of uh Pretty much everybody across the basketball world, I think, at least like the real basketball world, not not the Twitter basketball world. Um, I guess we'd probably have to go with uh, with Pop for number one because he's just a quote machine. Um, then maybe Stan Van Gundy because being a Pistons fan, I've seen some of his work. And uh, Steve Kerr, I didn't realize he he had a knack for speaking his mind to the degree that he does, but uh, I think he's pretty funny, pretty clever, and he's. Uh, again, regardless of one's political leanings, uh, he's clearly uh, a man of conviction who's not afraid to to express it after his his uh, his words following the uh, the recent election. Yeah. So yeah, I guess that'd be Kerr, it. When he talks, you know, when he talks about gun violence, and uh, you know, his his own father was uh, was shot at when he was a professor at American University in Beirut. Um, and that carries a lot of weight, and you can you can feel the the pain when he talks about things like that yeah he certainly would have a, a different perspective than uh than maybe most americans who would probably have a different view on guns in general than, than somebody who grew up in beirut yeah that was supposed to be a fun question how the heck did we get there oh we got dark didn't we <laughs> <laughs> all right let's wrap it up with this look into the future here if if the pistons 
are a top four team in the Eastern Conference. Let's say a little bit in the future. So let's say maybe four years from now. So 2020, 2021 season. Uh, which players from the roster are still in Detroit and what kind of roles do they have on the team? Okay, I'll qualify this first by saying that before Reggie Jackson went down with his injury, I thought the Pistons were a top four team this year in oh, the East. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, yeah. I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. I, and they still I, might be. I think that. I don't know if they're going to actually reach the four seed this year, but I think quality wise, by the end of the season, I think they can be there. Just like last sure. season when they when they ran up against the Cavs, they were not an eight seed team, you know, like they were statistically in the standings, the eight seed, but it, they were on 60, 62% win pace following the uh, Tobias Harris trade. Um, so they were on a 52, 53 win pace after they slid, they slid him into the starting lineup. Um, that was without a bench, like literally, Steve Blake was the starting point guard, and oh. he is struggling in Australia right now at last check. Oh. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's not great. Um, Any way you cut it, this bench is drastically improved. Uh, there was there was no John Luer off the bench for the Pistons last year. Um, they uh, they have across the board improved over what they took to the floor with last season, and. Um, I, you know, Ish Smith is not Reggie Jackson, which is why this is probably going to be a maybe a six seed. Um, but I think that they're going to be top four caliber by the end of the year. But who do you um, think are going to be like the players that stick around long term? Because I just want to think about you know what what the Pistons might look like. The long term core, yeah. Yeah, what's the long term core for that team? Because I can't, I couldn't really figure it out. Well, they have the uh, the advantage in that. They're really young, and they've got guys locked up for like through their youth and into the peaks of their of their careers. Uh, I think KCP. Again, I am an advocate for paying him whatever it takes to keep him. I think that the Pistons are going to do that, no matter what the fan base thinks, and I'm on board with that. Uh, that's going to be a four-year contract. Um, Reggie Jackson has four years left. Tobias Harris, uh, he signed a five-year deal, I believe beginning of last year so he's going to be around in four years and Andre Drummond is going to be around in four years he's signed a four plus one deal wow. so these these guys are going to all be in the uh, 27 to 29 range I think Reggie I'm trying to find um, he might be 30 I think he's 25 right now so these these guys are all going to be in like the 27 28 29 30 range uh, they're all going to be peaking right around that four-year mark, and they're all going to be still under contract, under this contract, with the exception of KCP, who's going to be getting his first payday. Um, so I think those are the four guys, and everybody else is probably going to rotate out. Um, you might find yourself with a surprise like uh, Darren Hilliard, who's been playing pretty well in um, basically Stanley Johnson's absence so far this season. Darren Hilliard's gotten some minutes lately, and he's played well. Uh, maybe you'll see a guy like him stick around, Stanley Johnson. Who knows if, who knows? <laughs> uh, he, he he got suspended on Friday. He played three minutes, I think, the the next game, and he played um, tonight. I think he played nine minutes and did not record his stat. And it was minus nine. So, you know, I mean, we'll see what happens with Stanley Johnson. He's a, a guy I'm pretty low on right now. Uh, but yeah, your your four man core for the foreseeable future is KCP. Reggie Jackson, Tobias Harris, and Andre Drummond. That's interesting. Yeah, the Hawks. Yeah, the, the another comparison between the two teams is the Hawks and Pistons are both. Uh, the team is run by their head coach, essentially. Correct. Yeah. That's how it yep. works for the Pistons, and and the 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 Hawks though they you know their core is it may be harder to figure out because you know they have Howard on a three year deal, and they extended Baysmore and. Or, I'm sorry, they signed Bazemore and extended Schroeder. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, you know, it's almost entirely a team of, of free agents other than the two rookies they drafted. So it's uh I think I think Detroit has a uh has maybe a clearer picture of, of what their their core will be than maybe the Hawks do. That's interesting. Yeah, assuming everything goes well and goes to plan and there's no injuries and nobody falls off the map or anything like that, you know, I think there's stability and continuity, which tends to work out pretty well when you've got good players in the NBA. Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much for joining us. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to, to do this. My pleasure, anytime. All right. Well, Hawks Pistons Friday night. Have a good one, Duncan. You too. Take care. See ya. Yeah. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to cars.com. It's magical.